Released by Chunsoft in the year 2009 the Nintendo DS, Zero Escape, 9 Hours, 9 Persons, 9 Doors, often called 999 for short, will be the first game in an eventual trilogy. Written and directed by series creator Kotoro Uchikoshi, the game is mainly a psychological horror visual novel with sci-fi and puzzle-solving gameplay elements. For story, the game features a college student named Junpei, alongside eight other kidnapped people who are forced to play in a death game and try to survive. The game features multiple endings with multiple routes based on the selection of doors the player chooses until the end, until there is one true canon ending. For gameplay, the story elements are broken up by a variety of puzzles tied in some way to numbers, and the overall death game, called the Nonary Game, is a numerical puzzle on its own. There are point-and-click adventure elements involving discovering items and manipulating a small inventory to uncover clues as well. Due to a plot element, the true ending of the game can only be accomplished once an entirely separate but specific playthrough has been accomplished. The story only gets larger from here, so let's cut it down to size with a recapitation. The year is 2027 and the game begins with an enormous cruise liner exploding, to which we are introduced to a college student named Junpei who is startled awake by a loud noise and tumbles out of bed. He finds himself in a strange bunk with a door with a number 5 splattered across it. He also sees a strange watch-like device that's been locked onto his wrist that also displays the number 5 and observing his surroundings, it appears he's inside of a ship. However, the window suddenly bursts open as water begins gushing in, and as his room begins flooding, his mind races. In the clarity, he recalls being kidnapped by a strangely masked man dressed in black, and being knocked unconscious quickly by a strange white smoke grenade before waking up here. He finds a locked suitcase, and solving the puzzle to its combination, he finds instructions on how to mathematically calculate a digital route, as well as some key cards and a calculator. Using this new knowledge to unlock the door before him, he escapes out of the flooding room only to soon find himself in a luxurious lobby. He runs into a group of diverse people who are also in a rush, quickly checking for any escape route out of here. As they check some large numbered doors, they all learn they each woke up here recently in a similar locked room scenario as Junpei. Most surprisingly, Junpei finds his childhood friend and secret crush Akane among the crowd, but their reunion is cut short as a voice comes over the speaker system. The voice introduces itself as Zero, the one who invited them all here to participate in a game where they put their life on the line, the Nonary Game. They discover the rules of the game in their pockets and learn that each of the numbered doors on the ship have a specific number, as do each of the nine people there. If there is a group of three to five people whose numbers are the digital route that match the door, then that door will open and all who enter a door must contribute and leave together as well. The goal of the game is simply to escape by finding a number nine door. He also mentions the ship is intentionally like the infamous Titanic ship, and is currently sinking with about nine hours left of staying afloat. A nearby clock chimes nine, and Zero declares the game has begun. At first, everyone rejects the game and begins scouring for other means of escape, but after searching, they find they are sealed in. They also learn that they are confined to three decks, A, B, and C, with a few additional locked doors and an elevator, all with unique locks and celestial symbols on them. Junpei finds it awfully suspicious that his childhood friend Akane is here in this motley mix of people, but for now, the group is faced with choosing between the door number 5 or number 4. Junpei insists that firstly, they should all at least organize themselves and introduce each other. Despite Akane introducing Junpei by name, a large man insists they use code names instead to hide their real identity in case Zero is listening in. He then calls himself Seven after the number on his bracelet. The silver-haired boy then calls himself Santa, as San means three in Japanese. An older man with the number one calls himself Ace after the card. A lady dressed as a dancer with the number eight calls herself Lotus after its eight petals. A blind man with the number two calls himself Snake after dice. A red-headed girl with the number four calls herself Clover after its lucky four leaves, and it's also revealed she and Snake are siblings. Akane volunteers to give out her real name since she outed Junpei, but Junpei instead names her June after the month and her number six. The final man who seemed oddly quiet and nervous this whole time, who does indeed hold the number nine, but doesn't want anything to do with them. Clover walks up to talk to him, but he then grabs her and pulls out a knife to her neck, telling everyone to back off. He moves her to door 5 and forces her to put her hand on a scanning panel next to it and to register her bracelet to this door. Junpei finds it awfully suspicious that this man knows how to operate these doors without anybody saying how. Mathematically, as the number 9, the man is in an advantageous position to work with any other group as 9 will not affect any digital route so he can move independently, and he knows this as he forces Ace to register his number 1 and then step back. When the number 5 door now opens, he shoves Clover away and dashes through, closing the door behind him with a smirk. The group finds the doors have relocked behind him, however they quickly hear loud beeping coming from within, and the ninth man now panicking, accusing some man of lying to him and getting him killed. The lock to the door is engaged and unable to be opened for now, as the group hears an explosion go off in the room, and then the locks disengage. 
Using their own numbers, they reopen the door without stepping in and are horrified to see the bloody fragments of the Ninth Man splattered beyond the door. June has a feverish spell and everyone is fearful about moving forward now, but Snake points out it wasn't a traditional trap that killed the Ninth Man, but likely because he broke Zero's rule of everyone who verified a door must go through and leave together as well. He produces a note given to him from Zero specifically in Braille to accommodate his blindness, and informs him since he cannot see and solve puzzles in that sense. He explains that there are red and dead devices to every set of doors, short for recognition and deactivation devices. The red devices allow people to open the doors and arm the detonators, and the dead devices deactivate the small bombs put inside them while they all slept, that will explode in 81 seconds if they are not hit by the same people who hit the red. In addition, the only way to remove the bracelets is to either escape or die. With the rules of the game now fully explained, they resign themselves to participating. With the remaining 8 people, they split to where Seven, Clover, Snake, and Ace can enter door 5, and Junpei, Jun, Santa, and Lotus can enter door 4. Junpei is actually interested in investigating the Ninth Man's body for clues since he did seem to know more, but doesn't want to expose Jun to the traumatic sight. He thinks fast and makes a hard decision to go through door 5 instead. Snake then says to subtract 5 from their group in order to accommodate Junpei, so Ace and Clover must go through door 4 now, and whispers something to Clover before she goes. So now, Seven, Snake, and Junpei enter door 5 and the rest through door 4. Entering the door, Junpei and his team quickly find the dead to save themselves, though the remains of the Ninth Man show his bracelet is somehow still functional. Entering a first class cabin, they work to solve a musical riddle and progress forward, and Junpei feels Seven is acting awfully suspicious despite claiming he's an amnesiac. Now solving a card theme puzzle in a casino locked room, they make it up to C Deck and find the hospital room. In the room are four large doors, three with numbers and reds on them, for the numbers 3, 7, and 8 doors. Through the last door, the second group of June and team now enter, and everyone is surprised to meet up again. As they talk, Seven announces he suspects they're on the Gigantic, one of the two sister ships of the Titanic that was converted from a cruise liner to a hospital ship in the First World War, but it's only a theory, and so they turn to search for missing hardware needed to activate the three reds before them somehow missing parts. After an hour, the group reconvenes empty-handed, but now somehow the reds are repaired and functional, but now Snake is missing. As they search, Santa quietly mentions not to trust anyone as he suspects one of them repaired the doors without the others knowing and is keeping that and the other things secret. With Snake nowhere to be found, the group resigns to moving on ahead, but Lotus points out that right now, with seven people, there won't be enough people to get everyone through the doors. After all, no combination of four will result in three that works, so two groups of three will have to work, leaving someone behind. She motions a vote on who gets sacrificed, but Ace volunteers to stay behind, urging them to hurry and escape and come back to rescue him. He then turns and injects himself with an anesthetic called Soparol Beta he found in the hospital search, explaining he planned on using it at some point, though not himself. But with this, the group has no choice but to leave him behind. With the group split into three options for moving forward for either door 7 or 8, Junpei picks door 8 with Lotus and Clover, while Santa, 7, and June enter door 7. Beyond Door 8, they find the dead in time and avoid their bombs, but this time find themselves before a lab. With Clover and Lotus, who turns out used to work for a cybersecurity firm, Lotus muses that perhaps human minds are simply like wireless monitors, receiving data from a remote source and not independently. Such an idea may explain why there are people with data processing issues, like those who are blind, amnesiac, or suffer illnesses like prosopagnosia, which is the inability to recognize faces. Working together, they get through another locker room puzzle, during which Clover asks more about her brother and reveals he became blind through a bad car accident that claimed his vision. He even lost his arm and his current left one is a prosthetic. After escaping the room, they are surprised to find the second team so fast and even more surprised to find their joint hallway leads right back to the hospital room where Ace still is. Ace is woken up from his nap and each team found a celestial key to open corresponding celestial doors, but Clover still wants to check door 3 to see if Snake was there. Lotus urges them to check out the Celestial Locks in the meanwhile, so she and Santa investigate one door, while Junpei and June investigate an elevator. After some foreplay wordplay, they take it and pass by the flooded but sealed D deck into the lower E deck. Finding door 6, they report back to Lotus and Santa, who found door 1. Returning now to the hospital room, they find Clover and the others returned as well, but with the dismal news that they found Snake, dead in the same gruesome manner that killed the Ninth Man. Seven suspects Snake was murdered by at least two other people who opened door 3 with him and pushed him in alone to die while everyone else was searching for the red devices. Ace suggests Zero killed Snake in order to rattle their trust and divide themselves so they all lose the death game, but this backfires as Clover then suspects one of them here is Zero. As the clock chimes in signaling 3 hours left in the game, they focus for now and find the number 2 door, which makes the only door left unfound the ninth door. 
With three door options, the seven prisoners each vote on which door they want to enter. Junpei is allowed to announce the votes, but secretly cheats and reads his last, changing it to whichever one he wants, which is door six. They reorganize and discuss, resulting in Junpei, Jun, Santa, and Ace going through door six, and Clover, Lotus, and Seven going through door one. Beyond, they find a massive engine room and Jun suddenly feels feverish again. As she rests, the guys solve the puzzles within, and Santa says this all reminds him of this one experiment, where scientists ran rats through a deadly escape puzzle, but each generation of rat got faster at finding the exit to the point of instantly knowing. Stranger still, the same experiment with a completely different set of rats yielded even faster results somehow, as the rats in the first experiment were solving it. Santa doesn't know what it meant, but remarks that in a crisis, the real character and potential of a person comes out. Solving the picture, Junpei picks up June, and returning, he sees Santa staring darkly at a picture. He explains it's a picture of his sister, and wonders if he's the type of person who rewards others or punishes others. Moving past the puzzling action, they run into the cargo room now, and find cards with pictures of all nine of the players on them. They also find a box with nine slots, and Junpei is relieved to find this puzzle blatantly obvious. However, June has another fever spell, and he leaves to Ace to put the pictures of them all in numerical order. Santa mentions that when they get out, Ace can likely get medicine for her easily, as he told them he's actually the president of Cradle Pharmaceuticals, whose prized product is an anesthetic called Soparil. Junpei finds it awfully suspicious that Ace is somehow unable to arrange their pictures in numerical order, and suddenly remembers what Lotus mentioned earlier about prosopagnosia, and suspects Ace suffers from it. Solving the puzzle easily, Junpei solves another puzzle, and in doing so, they uncover a strange ornate coffin, and within it, another key, and a gun with six bullets. Intimidated by the gun, Junpei leaves it and takes the key, and after moving on, the group is relieved to finally discover door 9, but are soon shocked to find there is another door number 9 in this room. Junpei is stumped, but Santa says the letter from Zero never said there was one exit, and that was their own assumption. And seeing this, it means that all nine of them could have actually escaped and left, leaving no one behind, and the death game was actually designed so everyone could live. For well, whom they have now, if they left June behind, the three of them could leave right now, but all three of them agree to find the others, despite knowing that there was no way all seven people could leave together. Junpei now notes this room appears to be some sort of altar, and in it, another coffin. Returning to the main lobby, they find Seven and Lotus also there now explaining they can't find Clover who disappeared after searching on her own. The group of six now split up to search for her and Junpei thinks to check by the dead body of Snake. He rechecks the body and notes something seems off, and realizes this dead body has a left arm, while the real Snake didn't, so somehow this is a decoy corpse. Unfortunately when they return, the others have found Clover in the first class suite, literally stabbed in the back. In the same room, they find a safe that Seven found earlier but couldn't open, but Junpei suspects someone recently did. Searching for nearby clues on Clover's killer, he wanders to the hallway where the ninth man died, and Junpei notes how it's odd how his bracelet is now missing. However, he keeps this information to himself, though Seven now reports there was a note in Clover's hand. Picking it up, Junpei deciphers the riddle to a sequence that deals with their bracelets, revealing a sequence of numbers that turns out to be the combination for the safe. Within, Junpei finds a sheet full of information. He learns the nonary game was played once 9 years ago, Snake was part of the previous game, the owner of Cradle Pharmaceuticals helped fund it, and Zero wants revenge. Putting his hands in his pocket, Junpei asks all of them to follow him as he believes he has solved who killed Clover and Snake, and the clock now chimes, indicating they have one hour left to escape. Junpei first verifies one can verify a door just by having a bracelet near enough and a palm is not actually necessary. He then asks Ace to identify him, and then tells Ace he's actually Santa in Junpei's clothes. Ace retorts he's obviously Junpei because the bracelet for Junpei is 5, so he can't be Santa. Junpei then catches him, saying a normal person doesn't distinguish people by their clothes or numbers, but by their faces. And Ace could not obviously tell the difference, so he must have prosopagnosia, and this clinches Ace as the killer. Junpei explains his evidence. First, Ace volunteered to stay behind in the hospital room at first since they would have required him to open door number 3, and without him, he could hide the dead body in the shower. Second, the dead person in the shower wasn't Snake, but a person in Snake's clothing, which is something someone with prosopagnosia could not tell. The motive is clear when one considers Snake knew Ace's identity, and thus could either reveal him or hold a grudge on him. Ace admits he is the CEO of Cradle, but the note Zero left is a trap meant to frame him. However, Junpei reveals Ace has the number 9 bracelet on him, and thus was the only person who could have opened the 3 door by himself. Breaking down, Ace admits everything Junpei has said is true, and that he even got the knife he killed Clover with from the ninth man's corpse after he held up Clover earlier. He did indeed grab the number 9 bracelet, run into a disoriented man that we thought was Snake with the number 2 bracelet, and so opened the number 3 door and shoved the mystery man into it to die. 
He then confronted Clover, who saw something past door one, and given what Snake had likely told her, he had to kill her to silence her. He then proclaims he didn't lose to Junpei, but to Zero, who somehow knew Ace would do all of these things and set up his trap unerringly. He then grabs Lotus as well as the gun from the coffin and holds her hostage. He explains he also lied to the Ninth Man, setting him up to be killed so he would not only serve as a test to the severity of the consequences of the game, but also because the Ninth Man knew Ace's real identity and this game, and this would allow Ace to also claim the Nine Bracelet. He now moves away with Lotus and intends to use her to open the Nine Door on his own. Seven and Junpei follow after him anyway, but are too late to stop him from entering one of the doors. They now hear knocking from within the coffin and opening up, they find Snake alive and in a change of clothes as suspected. Snake explains he actually was knocked out by some gas and has been here ever since, so it likely means Zero had someone else put on Snake's clothes. In fact, Seven now produces what Clover found and he pulled off her body earlier, which is a bracelet with the number Zero on it. Testing it out without leaving, they find the bracelet scans but doesn't produce a Zero, which is something Snake suspected. Trying a few combinations, they learn that while this watch claims it's Zero, it's actually Six, whatever that suggests. They now hear water begin filling the lower levels, and Snake says he has an idea so the three of them could enter the last door now. Crushing his fake arm and squeezing off the bracelet, Snake is now immune to the effects of the door, and the three of them dash forward. They find themselves in front of a giant incinerator, and within it, Ace with Lotus still hostage, and yet another nine door behind them that Ace can't open. The incinerator now warns it will close in nine minutes, and Ace infuriates and mocks Snake for killing Clover personally. Snake flies into a rage, and while Ace shoots him and puts him down, Snake rises up, coldly determined to kill Ace. Ace empties the rest of his bullets into Snake, but Snake still clutches strongly onto him like a man possessed. Escaping out of the incinerator as it closes, they yell out to Snake, but he is fiercely determined to die, taking Ace down with him as they are both burned to death. Junpei finds an elevator back to Jun and Santa, but finds Jun by herself collapsed before the altar. He hurries to her, calling out her real name, and is horrified to find her so cold. She tells him she's not likely to make it, and that she's always liked him ever since they were kids. Zero now comes on the intercom, explaining the game is now over, and Junpei has chosen the wrong path. However, Zero explains the true loser is Zero himself, and the confused Junpei hears a door close behind him. He leaves Akane behind for just a second to check and sees no one, but is shocked to turn back and see Akane has gone into thin air. He screams for her and gets no reply, and as the game ends, he sees a familiar smoke grenade release its fumes and collapses, as the amount of players to escape this round is zero. That is, for this timeline. As the game begins for a different but similar Junpei, the events progress exactly as before, but this time, rather than change his mind and enter door 5, this Junpei is chosen to enter door 4 with Lotus, June, and Santa. As they solve their first puzzle, June mentions how this ship is like the Titanic Zero mentioned, and how she believes the story of how a curse actually sank the Titanic. As rumor goes, in the cargo hold of the Titanic was a cursed mummy stolen from Egypt that was frozen in ice. Santa then angrily finds and gives Junpei a four-leaf clover bookmark, claiming he found it but hates the notion of hope, faith, and luck. They find an abstract picture, and Lotus mentions she recognizes this from a book she read that talked about the morphogenetic field, which relies on the theory of morphic resonance, which is kind of like telepathy in which information is transmitted through an unseen medium. She brought up the study in which two large groups of people with a picture, with both groups guessing at what the image was. What's strange is that when the second group was told the answer and the first group was retested, somehow, with no communication to the second group, the number of correct answers jumped significantly in the first group, apparently because more people elsewhere knew the correct answer. While she laughs it off as pseudoscience, something within Junpei feels off and his head slightly hurts. As they move along and solve a puzzle in the kitchen, June then brings up the novel Futility, which is a real-world story about a cruise liner named Titan that uncannily detailed the sinking of the ship and the tragedy in eerily the same way the actual Titanic did, though the book came out years before the ship did. In the story, even the cause, the time, the date, the dimensions of the ship, and even its speed and cause of failure all ended up happening in the real Titanic over a decade after it was written. Stranger still, there was another book written by another author, whose similar events to the Titanic occurred even with the iceberg collision, and June suggests the possibility both authors were guided to write their stories by another spirit. In fact, she suggests the possibility of one of the authors actually possessing himself to write about the incident 20 years before it happened because his future self was on the ship and witnessed it firsthand. Junpei is blown away by this random topic and focuses on the puzzle for now. 
Later, when solving a puzzle to get out of a locked freezer, she mentions how there's a special kind of ice called Ice 9 that actually has a melting point of 96 degrees Fahrenheit and mentions the potential for unseen communication at even the molecular level. Moving on to the hospital room, events play out at 4 when both teams meet, though this time Junpei joins Clover in 7 in door 7, while Santa, Lotus, and June head through door 8. This time, they must solve a puzzle within an operating room, and during which, Seven browses the chemicals and recounts a bizarre mass crystallization story similar to something Jun just said in the freezer. Junpei mentions Ice-9, and Seven has a sudden flash of memory, exclaiming there is a woman named Alice here that will not melt at room temperature. He mentions that after the Titanic sunk, the ship that was sent in to collect the bodies of the dead also found a curious wooden coffin. They soon found that unlike the frozen bodies in the water, hers did not melt, and they soon called her All Ice, and eventually Alice. But one day, her coffin mysteriously disappeared. It reappeared one day in a New York auction, where it was bought by the same man who eventually bought the Gigantic, and thus Seven believes Alice is here on the ship. Jupe finds it matches up to the story of the frozen mummy June told him earlier, but doesn't know what to make of it. Clover begins to fear Snake might be dead, and her next, so Jupe decides to cheer her up by giving her the four-leaf Clover bookmark he was handed earlier, and after he encourages her to not give up hope and look forward with faith and love, she begins to soften and warm up again. She then begins to tell him about what happened on this ship nine years ago, as she was part of this experiment to help discover psychic powers that can communicate through unseen fields. She then mentions a few philosophical paradoxes, such as Locke's socks or the ship of Theseus, which begs the question, how much of an original thing can be replaced before it ceases to be the original thing? For example, if you take a boat and replace old parts, is it the same boat when all the old parts are eventually replaced? Or, if you built a new boat with all those old parts, which boat is actually the original? She is about to continue on with what this has to do with the experiment when Seven interrupts them and reminds them to focus on escaping. As the two groups reconvene in the hospital, events play out similarly again until the group must then choose between the 1, 2, and 6 doors. Junpei almost gets caught with his cheating trick by Santa, but chooses door 1 this time. So it's Junpei, Clover, and Ace through door 1, and 7, Santa, June, and Lotus through door 6. Junpei finds himself in the ship's chart and wheel room, and then the captain's room, where he remembers Zero claiming to be the captain of the ship. Within, they are shocked to find a man in captain's garb dead on the floor with a bloody axe beside him and wearing a bracelet with the number 0 on it. It all seems a little too convenient to Junpei, and he doubts this is actually Zero. Examining the body, Junpei compares the condition of this corpse to the one they found Snake in, though when describing the brutality, Clover pauses him and realizes the man dead behind door 3 couldn't be Snake because Snake had a fake left arm, unlike the dead body they found. She weeps in relief that her brother must be alive somewhere, but hearing Santa was the one who gave Junpei the Clover bookmark he gave her earlier for hope, she then realizes Santa must have been another test subject like herself and Snake 9 years ago. She stops herself from confusing Junpei further and explains it from the top. Nine years ago, herself and a group of nine were subjects in a previous nonary game in order to test the theory of morphogenetic fields, namely telepathy. She's about to reveal the name of a girl who died during the previous game when Ace interrupts again. Finding a red book, they open it to reveal all Ice's name on it and a keycard indicating something beyond the library in the ship. Junpei explains what he's learned about Alice, and as they leave, he notes Clover has put something large in her pocket. The two groups then reconvene, with the second group excitedly reporting they found the number 9 door, though he's surprised to find two 9 doors in the room they bring him to. The realization that all seven of them getting through both doors is impossible, and thoughts now exchange on what to do next. Santa then makes the bold order that himself, June, Ace, and Lewis will leave, and suddenly and maliciously pulls a gun on June to ensure everyone else complies. Junpei surrenders and complies with Santa, and urges Ace and Lewis to cooperate for now. As they are left behind, Junpei, Seven, and Clover wonder what to do now. They now hear the sound of knocking on the coffin within the altar room and see it's locked. Junpei then experiences a flash and hears a voice instructing him on how to figure out the combination and is even more surprised to see it works. Snake now emerges alive and well, much to the joy of Clover, though with his clothes changed. They catch Snake up on the events so far and Snake explains he's been unconscious since the hospital room when someone gassed him and he's only just now woken up. More importantly, with Snake, they can now all enter the other 9 door and do so. Junpei now confronts Clover on what he suspected about her taking the Zero Bracelet and she confesses, but when they test it out, it turns out that despite displaying a Zero, this bracelet actually registers as a 6. This then begs the question of what number June actually is since it's unlikely there are duplicate numbers, and Snake theorizes her bracelet is just upside down and she's actually been 9 this entire time. 
Clover points out that that doesn't add up for the groups and numbers she's been in, but Seven points out one more thing, that Santa has conveniently been in every room June has been in since the beginning to end, forcefully in some cases, so it's possible Santa's number is not only false, but is likely a zero. It still means that there are some duplicate numbers, but it definitely means that something is strange with Santa and June. Entering the Nine Door for now, they find more locked celestial doors as well as a large library. Within, Snake comes clean about the experiments of Junpei, despite an early warning from Zero earlier not to talk about it to anyone. Nine years ago, there were experiments around the morphogenetic field that took place at the same time, one location being a ship and the other a building in Nevada. The whole experiment was backed by Cradle Pharmaceutical, who wanted to test how to control human minds through resonant events, and after screening children to see who had the psychic potential for accessing this field, they kidnapped nine pairs of siblings for the experiment. One set of siblings meant for transmitting information was put in the Nevada facility, and the other group meant for receiving information was put on the ship Gigantic. He then said that there was one pair of siblings in which the girl had actually died, the brother Aoi and the sister Akane. Junpei then wondered suddenly if it was the same Akane he saw now as June, but dismissed it as impossible. Moving past the library in another locked room, they find a photo of the four founders of the Nonary Games, and Junpei recognizes the mustached man as the one murdered in the captain's room, and the scientist in the picture as the ninth man who died in the beginning of the game. In addition, the man in the hat is actually Ace, but somehow Junpei felt he already knew that despite learning it for the first time here. Seeing the picture suddenly clears up Seven's amnesia as well, as he recalls he's actually an independent investigator, who was chasing the case of the missing children nine years ago. He was caught tailing the crew loading the children onto Gigantic and found himself inside a ship cell. Escaping through a grate, he heard the voices of children in panic, especially after hearing the countdown announcement for an incinerator, and he found them locked in an incinerator below. Leaving them and coming back, he then saw less children than before, but they explained that a group of them left through the Nine Door already, so he makes do with rescuing the few remaining. He then hears a man yell about the sudden disappearance of the kids. The man entered, and it was the CEO of Cradle, the man called Ace, enraged at the interruption. He gave chase and eventually snatched Akane back and threw her back in the incinerator. Seven couldn't rescue her in time, and so the girl ended up getting burned alive. Returning to the present, Seven recognizes Snake as the boy he saved from the experiment and reveals the last name of the girl who died to be Kurashiki. Junpei is stunned and his mind flashes again, as this means the girl who died 9 years ago has the exact same name as the Akane with them right now. He then reveals Santa's name to be Aoi Kurashiki, and that was Akane's brother, and they further conclude the three mysterious men dead on the ship so far are the other three founders of the Nonary game. Junpei then somehow knows Santa is not Zero, or at least is not killing the founders, though it seems logical the next person to be targeted is the final founder, Ace. They follow their route until they come across an incinerator when they find Santa and June knocked to the side, and Ace has taken Lotus hostage. Seven confronts Ace on being the Cradle CEO and co-founder of the Nonary Games, and Junpei confronts him on his prosopagnosia, which again, he somehow just knows. Ace forces them away, and scans his own, Lotus's, and the Ninth Man's bracelet in, but to his shock, the door does not open. Seven takes the opportunity to close the gap and knock down Ace and save Lotus, and Junpei confronts Ace on killing the other three founders of this game, with the clues he found out recently and also somehow knew suddenly. He confirms purposefully killing the Ninth Man, and accidentally, but still intentionally, killing his assistant that was dressed as Snake. Lastly, since he knew the solution to every puzzle, Ace was able to get into the captain's quarters and murder the last co-founder before Junpei and Clover were able to investigate there. Ace admits this and explains the reason for the last murder is because the man there was also to serve as a living witness to the offer Zero privately made to Ace to confess his crimes in the past publicly. Because of his prosopagnosia, he could not recognize the faces of his former associates and kill them due to circumstance. Of course, this was all per design of Zero, and Junpei and Seven now out Santa, aka Aoi Kurashiki, as Zero. Santa admits he is Aoi from the experiment nine years ago, but states he's not Zero, but rather is Zero's assistant. He also corrects their claim that this is all for revenge. It partly is, but this nonary game is actually set up to save Akane, though when they turn to face June, she has seemingly disappeared into thin air. Santa then explains the Nonary game was set up to test morphogenetic fields, or the ability to transmit and receive information through an invisible medium. There were two facilities set up, one was on the Gigantic and the other was in Building Q, a warehouse in Nevada built to precisely mirror the interior of the Gigantic. Within, the Nonary game was played by a group of transmitters, and they were meant to send the puzzle solutions to the receivers on the ship. 
However, a mistake was made and Akane, who was a transmitter, was accidentally put on the ship with the other receivers. Santa then looks Junpei dead in the eye and says he knows that Junpei knows things he shouldn't and couldn't. And how? Through a morphogenetic field, of course. And with that, Santa picks up the drop gun, aims it at Ace, and forces them both through the door, which now opens for them and leaves the rest of the group in the incinerator. We then see the true observer to the whole scenario, who reveals himself to be the true Zero, or at least the person who will become Zero, who has observed this Junpei and others and sent information to him through the morphogenetic field across time itself. And this is the young Akane herself. As it turns out, like Akane, Junpei is actually an esper, able to remember information from different timelines. In truth, the Akane of nine years ago suddenly resonated with Junpei nine years in the future, who was a boy she had a deep bond with. And as she survived with the encouragement of hope from a boy named Light, who would eventually become Snake, the group of nine children solved all the puzzles and made it to the end when they were then trapped in the incinerator. Events played out as Seven had described, so when it was just Akane then trapped in the incinerator, just as Junpei is now, a computer panel displaying a Sudoku puzzle now appears before both of them. In her timeline, Akane now reaches out to Junpei in the current timeline, and he now hears her, and is able to communicate back for the first time. It all now makes sense to Junpei. All of this, the current Nonary Games, was set up by Akane who was really Zero. From the past, she is tapping into a future timeline in which she survives, sets up this death game as Zero, and influences a version of Junpei that eventually solves this exact puzzle in order to save her past self 9 years ago, so she can survive and actualize this timeline. So far, she has experienced multiple timelines linked with multiple Junpeis, all ending in failure, until finding this one where he succeeds. Solving the Sudoku and saving Akane in the past all seems well for Junpei, as he's able to also deliver the current group safely from the incinerator. Akane is reunited with her brother, and Seven in the past is able to save all the kids from the sinking Gigantic. However, Akane knows to herself that this is only the beginning for her, as she must now put in motion a future in which Junpei saves her. Meanwhile, Junpei, Lotus, Seven, Clover, and Snake escape upwards and emerge out to find themselves in Building Q in Nevada. As their bracelets fall off, they see theirs in particular never actually had detonators in them, and what more, someone conveniently left them an SUV outside, with plenty of supplies and fuel to leave the desert, and Ace tied and bound in the trunk. They see a fresh pair of tire tracks ahead and conclude Aoi and Akane must have left before them, and now race to catch up. They ask Ace why he helped make the Nonary game in the first place, and he said that, for himself, it was meant to help him pass his prosopagnosia if he was able to understand how other people process faces, though there were other reasons. Junpei then asks if Alice was ever real, and Ace explains there never was an Alice, as nine years ago he found and opened the hidden coffin, but all there was inside was a special type of Mandragora plant that eventually he made into his highly profitable soap world anesthetic. As the game ends, they find a strange woman in Egyptian clothing hitchhiking in the road, and while Junpei finds it awfully suspicious, he soon realizes who she is. 999 has enjoyed the success of selling over 350,000 copies worldwide. This recapitation was chosen by Nick Soto. Thank you so much for supporting the show as a patron. If you would like to support the show yourself, please follow the Patreon link in the description below.